Chapter 10 Van took inventory while walking. Dislocated shoulder, cracked rib, sore nipples, whipped rear, two bullet grazes, and a broken pinky toe. Damn toe. Not only that, but he was a filthy, stinking mess again. He wouldn't die, perks of immortality, but he would need a patch job. He hoped Ski had steady fingers and some skill with sutures. Ski. Vance spoke into his wrist communicator. Damn it, where are you? My tummy hurts too. He thought. The residual traces of poison were doing his insides no favors. He felt sorry for himself and weirdly hungry. He hoofed it back to the hotel, ignoring the invasive stares of the locals. He knocked on Ski's door. No answer. He grumbled then went to his room. He peeled off his sticky robes and tried to figure out where to begin with self-administered first aid. He made his choice, and after six failed attempts, finally snapped his shoulder back into place. He whimpered like a helpless child, then burrowed into his bed. He had barely shut his eyes when his communicator spoke. Hey, Pops! Ski, where are you? Took a walk. Gorgeous day out. I thought I told you to stay in your room. Damn, what's with the grump? I'm on to something. I've got a lead on my dad. That's great, but I... A few people I talk to recognize his name. Most of them run in some shady circles, though. Eh, suppose it's not saying much. Crash down. Ski, listen to me. I could use a hand. I, I think I know where to go to next. When you're done with dinner, you should come meet up with me. Dinner was... Oh. Oh, crap. What? What is it? Silence. Ski? More silence. Then muffled noises. Vance sat upright and held the comm to his ear, attempting to overhear something, anything that would indicate what was going on. Finally, what the hell are you looking at? Excuse you. Oh, look, but don't touch, fellas. Hey, get off me. Van opened his mouth to speak, but shut it quickly. Her communicator was turned to an open channel. If he spoke, whoever was harassing her would hear him and discover the device. Instead, he muted the microphone. Vance's heart raced, listening to the abduction. Come on, Ski, tell me where you are. Give me a hint. I have no idea. I haven't seen him in ages. Don't ask me, pal. How did I end up where? At Crashdown's most exclusive brothel? I felt like some action. Good girl, good girl. He threw on his still syrupy robes, shouldered his satchel, bolted out the door, and sprinted toward the marketplace. He paused only to ask people along the way, Where is Crashtown's most exclusive brothel? In a rush, eh? said one random wise guy. I know the feeling. A handful more inquiries revealed he was looking for Schlarkies, located in the center of town. He followed the directions given to him while listening for clues on the communicator. I told you, I don't know, okay? But if I find him, who should I say is looking for him? Vant continued to run, ignoring his body which longed for a break. Ski's voice appeared again. Tell me this, are you gonna kill me, torture me, or rape me? I wanna know so I can mentally prepare. Oh, okay, well that sucks. Uh, nice place you got here though, by the way. It's real swank. If it wasn't for the hideous statue out front, I wouldn't have even known that this was a whorehouse. Hey, no, let go, it's, it's, on, it's only a bracelet. It doesn't do anything. A quick burst of static, then silence. The window of opportunity to save her was closing. Vant weaved in and out of foot traffic. He neared the center of town, apparent from the concentration of shops and eateries. His eyes darted in every direction, searching for a hideous statue. At long last, he identified one that certainly qualified. A voluptuous naked woman riding a tiger, leaping into a flower. Beyond the sculpture lay a windowless, faux mahogany bordello. This had to be the place. Vant burst through the door. Inside, a dozen men had Ski surrounded. She was gagged, bound, and being stuffed into a sack. Her eyes lit up at the sight of Vant. The men unholstered singe pistols and pointed them at Vant. He raised his hands. Running away would have meant a flaming bullet in the back. So instead, as if in slow motion, he put one foot in front of the other and walked toward the bar. The men stared at him, baffled. Vant hopped onto a bar stool. He drummed his fingers on the countertop. Hey, you. One of the gruffer-looking goons said. Me? 
Yeah, you, crash trash. The hell you want? I'm a customer. Yeah. Woo, I really, really need to get laid. What, what, do you, what do you got in stock? The men laughed, befuddled by Vance Gall. It granted him mere moments to assess the environment and his predicament. The interior was dark with wooden walls and burgundy curtains, posh in a cheesy kind of way. The smell of incense and expensive tobacco permeated the premises. Unlike the main area, full of the shifty fat cats, the rest of the place was empty, apparently cleared out for the day. While the men bearing down on Vant resembled nothing more than low-rent hitmen, they were armed, which made them dangerous. One thug, tightly gripping his gun, said, This guy don't look right, he's covered in blood! <sighs> I don't like this man, not one bit! Another added, So how does this work? Are drinks complimentary, or do I just get straight to the sex? Whack a thwack, boss. A bruiser said to the largest, tackiest dressed man. How you want this sick dick laid out? Hold your horse, he answered. His flashy ensemble and gallons of cologne indicated this guy had to be Schlarky, owner of the establishment. He grinned, revealing a full set of diamondoid teeth below diamondoid lined eyebrows. This little ball bag knows our girl. Look at the way she's looking at him. No whack, no thwack. Let's crack open his brain and see what he knows. Oh boy. I think there's been a little misunderstanding, so I better go. Don't worry about me, I'll take my business to the BJ machine down the street. Playing coy, Vant moved his hands toward his weapons. You're already in a pile of shit. Don't make it shittier. Okay, guys, guys, I just want to put my thingy into another thingy. I'm a client, I swear, I'll prove it. Bring me a woman, I'll do naughty things to her. That's so. Fine, then. Cost is three hundy. Make him green. Payment in advance. He held out his palm. Vance smiled and sheepishly patted down his robes. Oh, oh, man, this is... Wow, this is embarrassing. I seem to have left my capsules in my other cloak. Schlarky polished his pistol against his inseam. <laughs> you know what kind of guy comes into Crash Town's hottest hen house without any money? What kind? The dead kind. The gangsters raised their weapons. One of them broke off from the pack and closed the door for privacy. Oh, okay. All right, you got me. I'm not a customer. Schlarky tapped the barrel of his gun on his lips. Let's wait until I've pulled out your fingernails and put them down your throat. People tend to be more honest around then. Ski fought against her restraints. Schlarky scolded her. Don't mess up that tight little skin of yours. Oh, 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 oh. You'll be wrapping it around my customers soon enough. Once I get some Lucy juice in you, you're gonna be one hell of an earner. Schlarky's gun barrel caressed Ski's chin and slid down her chest. Let's make a trade, huh? Vance said. You let the girl go, you can have me instead. I'll even wear her dress. Just don't know how to keep your yap trap shut, do ya? The minions closed in on Vant. Two restrained his arms, and one held a gun to the back of his head. Schlarky grabbed a fistful of Ski's hair and pulled her head backward. He gnawed on her neck with his sparkling teeth and said, Just for that, I'm gonna make you watch me sample the tramp. The gangsters laughed. Do it, Schlark! Break her hind, then blank her mind. Tie the sack up to her neck. I'll need an hour just on her head. Ski's eyes shut. Vance struggled against his captors. The men howled with glee. Then, metal pierced flesh. Ah! Schlarky dropped his pistol. An embedded dagger was sticking out of his palm. He gripped the impaled hand. More blades zipped through the air. Each gangster was tagged in the leg, the arm, or the side. One by one they collapsed calling out in confused shock. What the shit? One of them screamed as he clutched his thigh, a knife wedged into the fat. Where did that come from? Another hollered. He attempted to identify the source of the attack while reaching for his fallen weapon. A figure dropped from the ceiling and landed on his arm, breaking it in two. In a blur, the assailant separated the men from their firearms. Vad wasted no time. He ran towards Ski. Too slow. A sword was pressed to his throat. He stopped, 
raised his hands and looked down the length of the blade to find it extended from a gunmetal gray mechanical arm. The elaborate appendage belonged to an emaciated stick of a being. Its ribs and hip muscles jutted from its frame, and an extreme hunchback gave it the look of a rabid possum protecting its babies. The fuck is that? Schlarky screamed. Terror spit flying from his mouth. Circling Vant, the entity moved with fluidity, assisted by legs bending backward at the knees. A tight hood wrapped around its head, and underneath, Vant could make out red-tinged eyes, definitely cybernetic. They faintly glowed above a steel jaw that was welded to its skull. The thing had no chin or mouth, only the one chunk of grotesque prosthetic. The sword pressed harder. Words slipped from Vant's lips. I'm a good guy. In a blink, the being cut Ski's bindings to free her. In another blink, the blade was back at Vant's throat. Ski rid herself of the loose restraints and approached, saying, What the hell are you? The entity raised a gloved hand from its normal arm, demanding silence. She obliged after one more comment. No, that guy, that's Vant. He's with me. The sword folded into the underside of the being's mechanical appendage. Replacing the blade, two foot-long fingers and a thumb extended and formed into a claw. They clamped around Schlarky's neck. A flicker emitted from the optics of the shadowy figure's eyes, followed by a holographic image hovering in front of its face. She's mine, the projection read. The lettering was a direct match for the warning message Ski had received earlier at the Corpobots. Fine, fine! It's not who we want anyway! It's a backstabbing father! The cyborg dropped Schlarky and turned back to Ski. It was quick, but Ski was quicker. She had already dived across the floor to Cassidy and had a bead on the metal-jawed menace. Don't move! It raised its arms, including the unsettling mechanical one. She approached with caution, leaning in to get a better look. A strobe of light blazed from its eyes. Ski dropped, temporarily blinded. Vance struggled to regain focus. When he did, the figure was gone. What was that thing? What does it want from me? Ski was rattled, but turned full-on distraught after noticing Vance's appearance. Why are you covered in blood, you psycho? It's a long story. Wait. He touched Ski's shoulder. Something was amiss. After being blinded, Vant had heard no sounds of the Enigma exiting the premises. Furthermore, the brothel had no windows and only one door. The attacker was likely still in the room. Vant retrieved Death's mask from his satchel and put it on. Blackness. Pulses. Silhouettes. He read the waveforms of Ski of the incapacitated gangsters, and carefully scanned the room. He pointed at the farthest corner where the ceiling met the wall. The being was concealed, folded into an intricate shape. Through Death's eyes, Vance saw that the figure was not violently pulsing red. Like the Peacekeepers, this villain was not marked for elimination, as had been the body snatchers of Land Escape. Its visual signature was normal, Innocent. There. With its hiding space compromised, the being used its bionic arm to swing from beam to beam over their heads. A dropkick shattered the door, and it darted into the open. Catapulted by inverted legs engineered for speed, it fled into the streets. Ski followed outside in pursuit. No, wait! That freak knows something. I've got to catch up. Ski cocked Cassidy and held down the slider. The shotgun squealed as the firearm charged. When it was on the edge of overload, she let go of the pump action, pointed the gun behind her, and pulled the trigger. The force of the burst propelled her ahead. She fired again, then again. With every blast, the momentum launched her faster and faster. Her hair plastered back from the wind as she tore through the streets after the figure. Her booted feet only tapped the ground for stability and to make course corrections. Vant blinked in awe. Okay then. He surveyed the mobsters, who looked at him for an explanation. He shrugged. His mind focused on the task at hand. He could not leave Ski to that thing. But he knew this might be his only chance to acquire intel on her father. So, he addressed the lowlifes. Gentlemen, 
I don't have a lot of time here. There's information that I need, and you're going to give it to me. So let's get past the whole I won't talk nonsense because this is how it's going down. Vant activated a gauntlet. Talk, or you get smashed in the dick. Gulps and swears came from the mouths of the injured men. Vant raised a thug to his feet and said, You, you, all right, I'm picking you at random, which is just bad luck for you, I guess. Now I'm going to wail on your dick. I mean, I'm really going to wail on it with this giant iron glove, and you may as well talk, because if you don't, I'm simply going to move on to the next guy, and then the next. So whether you spill your guts or it's another guy, one of you will talk after seeing all the smashed dicks. Now let me tell you something. If the fifth guy rats after four of you get smashed dicks, the four of you with the smashed dicks are going to feel pretty damn dumb. You're going to be like, why didn't I just tell the dick smashing guy what he wanted to know and save myself from getting a smashed dick? So I beg of you, don't be that guy. Don't be the regretful guy with the smashed dick. The men, especially the one in Vance's custody, looked stricken. So here we go. I'm going to ask this once and only once. Tell me about Geist Flyer. Anyone? No one spoke. All right. This one's on you. He made a grand gesture, as if preparing to punch the man in the crotch. Stop! It's no secret what that shit heel did to us. What do you want to know? Everything in 20 seconds. Schlarky spit on the floor. That strung out pus bucket. Geist was nothing more than a hood biting for my business. Just a small time thug. Pimpin' walkers and slinging juice. I had every intention of making him a stain, but I saw potential in him. My mistake. I took mercy on his ass, cleaned him up, and showed him the ropes. He moved up fast, on account he never talked back. Not that he could, that diseased prick. His mouth was so full of sex sores and pussy pots, he was basically a mute. That's why we all got to calling him Whispers. Saying the name put Schlarky in an even more agitated state. He grimaced at the dagger still wedged in his hand, but carried on, speaking with bile about his former associate. He made good scratch for me by doing favors, dealing in my clubs, swiping secrets, anything and everything. He got big, real big. Then he got greedy. He put a group of guys together and they ripped me off. Took more loot than you've ever seen in your life, I'll tell you that. I never should have made him what he was, that rat bastard. I have to find him. (laughs) No chance. Trust me, I've tried. Whispers is as good as gone. He skipped town years ago. I haven't heard so much as a peep from him or his crew. They vanished, proper. I thought we had a stroke of luck when that girl of yours came to town, but clearly she don't know nothing neither. Whether or not he spoke the truth, Ski was in danger. Vant, covered in blood, brandishing gauntlets of destruction and wearing a glowing supernatural mask, issued a reminder to the whimpering gangsters. Let's get something straight. If that nut job who stuck daggers in you isn't reason enough to leave the girl alone, I sure as hell should be. Yeah, yeah. You'll punch us in the dicks. We got it. Vant darted out the door with a brain full of information sure to traumatize his companion. He filed it away under the category... I'll deal with this later. Vance spied a light pole, the tallest nearby perch. He whipped the overhang and pulled himself up to survey the city. Through Death's mask, he located Ski, a fast-moving blur pursuing an erratically moving wisp. Their rapid motions created streaks in contrast to the slow-moving pedestrians. Ski's target collided with a gaggle of bystanders, slowing its escape. She closed in. Vant dove off the beam toward a ledge and clasped his free whip onto a nearby canopy. He alternated whip hands, swinging from rooftop to light pole to overhang to perch. While the foot chase below zigzagged through the narrow side streets, Vant took a direct path overhead. He gambled on their trajectory and it paid off. A few swings later and he was ahead of them. He latched himself onto a billboard advertising the Wart Blaster and dangled 20-odd feet above where they would pass. His heart thumped in anticipation as he watched them play cat and mouse. He waited and waited. He ripped the mask off and stowed it, deciding he would need his real eyes to pounce. There were too many people around and too much movement to focus otherwise. He waited 
and waited. They turned the corner. Vant dropped off the perch and took a swing with a gauntlet. He totally whiffed it. It was not even close. The figure was fast. It dodged at an angle, leaving Vant about faced. A bluish copper blur zipped by with Ski's trailing voice. <laughs> nice man. He cursed under his breath and swung back into the chase. He watched as Ski, using Cassidy as a turbo boost, closed in. Several times she got within grabbing distance, but the figure kept cutting abrupt paths down alleyways and corridors. Ski's high velocity had a downside. It was tough to turn on a dime. But she refused to quit. The menace was leading Ski into the crowded Central Market, a swap meet for off-putting devices and cheaply made knickknacks. Vant cut across the promenade and placed himself at the end, dangling below a street sign. He strategized from his overhang. The foot traffic was filtering through two side-by-side -side booths, one peddling a rubbery device called the Stimulizer, the other selling what resembled fruit but was clearly not meant to be eaten. If he timed an interference just right, he figured he might trip up the figure into one of the booths. He abandoned the idea of suppressing the foe with his gauntlets. He was too damn fast. He would have to take the impact head on. He bristled at the stupidity of taking a full force collision from a maniacal cyborg traveling at blinding speeds. He sighed. Oh, this is gonna suck. The figure entered the market. It twisted, turned, bobbed and weaved. It zipped around people, slid under carts, and vaulted over barrels of wares using its mechanical arm for torque. Ski was the opposite of deft, unable to keep up. She smashed into a cart of beer, sending suds everywhere. Sorry! She offered as she fired the gun again for thrust, only to be launched into a crowd of people that were none too pleased to receive facefuls of copper hair. She gave up on using Cassidy, and instead sprinted through the market on foot, dodging pedestrians and obstacles. At the end of the street, the figure took a beat to glance over its shoulder at the floundering ski. Vance seized the moment and dropped down between the booths, bracing for the impact. Which never came. The Enigma's retractable blade sliced through the produce stand next to Vant. Diced fruits splattered to the ground alongside splinters of wood. Vant watched his target disappear into the streets, and to make matters worse, Ski collided with him, sending them sprawling into the adjacent display. Pink fleshy toys toppled onto them as a salesperson screamed indecipherable obscenities. Ski cocked Cassidy, but Vant grabbed her by the back of her dress. Wait, that thing's dangerous. Let me go! Hold on a second, I can follow him without this nonsense, my mask. I don't care! She smashed his foot with her boot, right on the broken pinky toe. He released his grip and collapsed. She was off again. Of all the body parts Vant could have lived without getting violated twice on this impossibly long day, this was it. He shook it off to the best of his ability, attached himself to a flagpole, and once again donned the mask. He located the trail of the assailant as well as Ski. The chase had resumed. And yet again, he was on the ass end of the action. Vant's level of patience was in the gutter. His composure had turned on him. His stamina was sapped. But some way, somehow, he required the upper hand. The botched attempts thus far elevated this from important to essential for his damaged ego. It was time to fight dirty. He swung overhead, across the burrow. Again, he found himself ahead of Ski in the cyborg. He lowered himself into an alleyway, one he selected for a particular reason. He approached a peacekeeper in stasis mode. He knocked on its leg, and the machine roared to life. What? The operator bellowed from the head-mounted loudspeakers. Hey, you remember me? Your dinner guest? The guy who terrorized you? The hell you want? It wasn't the mayor's voice. It was one of his cronies. There's a lunatic cyborg coming this way. 100 blues if you fill it full of lead. 100 pills for some target practice? You're on. And there's a girl following behind. You hit her and the bounty's off. Are we clear? The peacekeeper spun the chambers of his shoulder-mounted Gatling gun in acknowledgement. Soon, Vant heard Cassidy's blasts and saw the figure evading Ski. Closer they came. Closer. It entered the alley. The peacekeeper's cannon ignited with bullet fire. The mysterious being leapt over the robot. The moment Ski hit the alleyway, Vant shouted, Cassidy, growl! 
Ski activated the repulsor shield moments before stray bullets pelted its blue exterior. As the artillery inadvertently hammered her defenses, the cyborg's motives were revealed. It stopped in its tracks at the sound of Ski's distress, altered its course, and extended its retractable sword. The fight was over before it had begun. The cyborg's blades slashed through the peacekeeper's metal frame. The robot squeezed off a few desperate rounds before the cyborg severed its gun, the slice accompanied by a shower of sparks. Fan, you son of a bitch! You owe me a hundred blues for this! The attacker cut through the peacekeeper's auditory mechanics, then its legs. The metal beast fell. The shadowy being took a beat to check on Ski. While distracted, Vant dove onto its hunchback. Ski, fire! Ski unloaded a blast of energy toward the two of them. Vant ensured the majority of the shockwave hit his adversary. They flew. Impact. The cyborg clipped a brick wall and tumbled down an enclosed loading dock. Vant somersaulted to his feet and activated his gauntlets. The figure, disoriented and damaged, wobbled itself upright. There was nowhere for it to run, but this thing was slippery. Vant refused to blink. His gauntlets pulsed at the ready. Ski caught up and aimed at Cassidy. Hey, move an inch and I'll blast you so hard your face will come out of your ass. Vant remained silent, although he made a mental note to give her hell later for that ridiculous comment. As the cyborg heaved oxygen, its hunchback rose and fell. It studied them with glassy red eyes. Why did you save me? The figure sized up Vant then returned its gaze to Ski. It was either calculating an escape or considering a response. Finally, from its eyes, a holographic readout displayed the words, For your father. Ski shivered, gulped air down her throat. Where is he? Static combined to form the word, Gone. Her eyes welled up. Cassidy shook from her trembling hands. A projection appeared. I can bring him back. Ski's lips were pursed. Her teeth were gritted. She studied the mysterious cyborg with squinted eyes. How? It took a step forward. Vant raised his fists. The readout lit up. Release me. It is the only way. I don't believe you. To Vant. Tie him up. Vant loosed the whips from his gauntlets. Wait. Stop. Ski noticed a projection beaming from the figure's eyes. The image was fuzzy and corrupted, but identifiable. Ski. It's your tattoo. No. She inched closer to the hologram. It's my dad's. Sure enough, the style was similar, but... Instead of spirals and paths, there were shapes and symbols. The hologram fizzled out. Ski looked at Vant. He remained on guard, unblinking. He said to the figure, There's information that I need. Something only Geist Flyer knows it's important. Lives depend on it. Everything depends on it. The cyborg lowered its head, as if prompting for the request. I have to know where an army resides, a massive force that has been invading towns and stealing their people. They wear suits of thallium armor. Can you get me that information? There are ways. The holographic readout then projected. If you release me. A decision had to be made. They had backed this unpredictable thing into the corner. One wrong move, and it might slice its way through them. There was no guarantee as to its integrity so letting it go was a massive risk. But taking it out meant severing the one link Ski had to her father and more blood on Vant's hands. Vant tilted his head towards Ski as if to say, you decide. This involved her family, so it was her decision to make. Also, he had no desire to get blamed for making the wrong call. Ski lowered her gun. I want to help. What can I do? The figure's bionic eyes studied her. Then the holographic display formed the word... Live. I'm trusting you. Don't make me regret this. It nodded and started to leave. Wait. What's your name? 
The hologram flickered, as if malfunctioning. After a few seconds of digital noise, a name materialized. Redemption. Ski tapped Vant on the shoulder. He retracted his whips and switched off his gauntlets. Ski said to the cyborg, Bring my dad back to me, please. It nodded and again showed the word, Live. She stepped back, providing an exit. Vant followed suit, albeit with attitude, to let the thing know who was the victor in the skirmish. If this is a trick, you better watch your back. The hooded figure paused, looked with interest at something behind Vant, and responded with the words, Watch your own. Over his shoulder, Vant discovered a dagger wedged into his back. Son of a bitch! He had been stuck by the cyborg mid-tussle. In the blink of an eye, it took for Vant to remove the knife. Redemption was gone. Vant and Ski walked in silence, headed back to their lodgings. Vant limped terribly and was still reeling from the horrors he'd experienced at the mayor's mansion. His bones ached and his wounds sizzled. The last drops of his adrenaline had washed away, leaving him with a hangover of cold shakes. And in one afternoon, Ski had been abducted by gangsters, attacked by a peacekeeper, and in a fight with a deadly cyborg. Hell of a day for both of them. Sorry I stomped your foot. I'm sorry I made a mechanical asshole shoot at you. They both kind of smiled and kept walking. Redemption. What was that thing? I've seen the type before. A deserter from Cycli, a township that believes in cybernetics as the path to immortality. Vant was woozy. He stumbled, nearly kissing the pavement. Ski propped him up as best she could. Oh, don't you die on me, Pops. I'll make you a promise. I won't die on you, ever. You can trust me on that. She looked at him sideways. But, uh, you're gonna have to patch me up. Yeah, no sweat. Just don't make me put on a naughty nurse outfit, which I'm pretty sure they sell at every damn store in this town. At the hotel, Ski tended to Vance damaged body. With care, she sealed his open wounds using medical supplies procured from a corpobot. She could not do anything for his broken bones. Those would have to mend on their own. But he would no longer leak blood, thanks to her. When done with the first aid, Vant rested his eyes. Ski flopped onto the bed next to him and propped her feet up against the wall. She stared at the ceiling in silence and gently petted Cassidy. After close to ten minutes, she spoke. Schlarky, did he tell you anything about my dad? Did he ever? Vant thought. Yet he was unsure how to answer her. What was the point in telling her the troubling news? Was the information given to Vant about Geist Flyer's addictions and criminal behavior even valid? Who knew if Schlarky even had an honest bone in his entire body? Vant decided to err toward caution. He said a little, not much. He was positive your father had left town, which validates what Redemption told us. Gone, he said. Not dead. How did he know my dad? Why was he after him? And then came the lie. It stuck on his lips and left a foul aftertaste. They didn't get into that. In his mind, he tried to convince himself why it was better to go this route, but it did little to fill the new pit in his stomach. As a concession, he added, But they said he used to go by the name Whispers. Ski was slipping away inside herself. She continued staring upward into nowhere. Ski, if there's one thing I know for certain, it's that answers don't live in the ceiling. And if we want to sort this whole thing out, we have to keep moving. And we gotta get out of this horrendous town. There's nothing here but stink. Yeah, I'm with you, but I've still got one lead to follow up on before we go. So do I. What's yours? The world's best magician. He was my dad's obsession, and I have to know if he was real and if he could have saved my mom. Yours? Some green sparkle I saw on my boss's mask. He thought for a moment. I don't know whose lead is thinner. Hmm, let's call it a tie. Not too much longer in this worthless pit, then. Tomorrow, we beat the streets while we wait for Redemption to give us a sign. Then we get the hell out of Crashtown.
Agreed? Agreed. Sounds easy enough. Can't be worse than what we've already been through. Don't jinx it. Thank you.